Ah. Uh, when I was getting out of the Marine Corps in America as a conscientious objector, uh, I got a job in a title insurance company. In California, uh, property sales are done by a title insurance company rather than by lawyers. So I did conveyancing. But surprisingly, the Torrens title system, which exists in Australia, of course, also exists in California. So I learned Torrens title, and I was in old systems title. In California, that meant that I had to research titles and the line of title back to Spanish land grants with property descriptions like somebody put on the top of a mountain and they could have everything that they could see. You know, and one elderly woman that I, I befriended because everybody else thought she was crazy, I thought she was wonderful, uh, she seemed to own San Francisco uh, and she was fighting to obtain it. Uh, and I got involved in her, her war, which she would never win, but she was a valiant fighter and I enjoyed working with her. And that was my first real interaction with what law can do and can't do. Later on, I came to Australia, uh, was working as a union delegate in the BLF, uh, went to work in Queensland for a while, worked in mines, built houses, did all kinds of things and found myself back in Brisbane where I was uh, working on the local council doing curbing and channeling and also selling encyclopedias door to door. I needed a real job. So I went back and, and lent on my experience as a title examiner in California, found out lawyers did it in Queensland, applied to the Law Society to see whether or not my credentials would be accepted in Australia. Um, and they told me they had no idea, but there was a job going as an article clerk, which I had no idea what one was. Um, articled, I didn't know what that was. Clark, we would have said clerk. So I had no idea what an article clerk was. Went to the job interview and got the job in a law firm. Uh, started a five-year indentured servitude to a law firm in Queensland in the very early 1970s and became a lawyer. No. In California, I pretty much majored in tear gas. It was during the 60s, uh, and we were more on the streets than in classrooms. It was a time of political turmoil. Uh, there was Mario Savio at the University of California with the free speech movement. There was ultimately the Vietnam War. There were, uh, it was a hotbed of youth feeling powerful um, and fighting against an even more powerful uh, establishment. And what that meant was unclear, certainly for me, but it was certainly an interesting experience and it really taught me a lot about social politics uh, and how social politics can work and how societies work. Uh, I've been engaged in them ever since. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I suspect that part of it's due to the fact that uh, um, we were the golden generation, and I'm not just talking about my hair color, um, all of which is now turning white, but at any rate, um, I think it was because we were privileged. We were the children of the, after the Second World War at a time in the 1950s, which started with austerity but ended with m abundance. The 60s was incredibly a rich time. We could afford to be radical. We could afford to believe. Uh, today, I think people are much more concerned about paying a mortgage or paying just the rent. Uh, and I also think social media has had a lot to do with that. Social media both can lead um, political movements, as we saw in, the, the, in Europe recently in, in the, the spring, um, but it can also detract from the ability of people to get together and actually share things. When you're only sharing things online and when personality and eye movement and everything else that goes with interpersonal uh, communications goes out of it, I think something dies. And I don't think people are as committed to a group as you are when you're one of them in person. I thought it was much more likely I'd be on the other side. Um, no. Um, my mother used to say to me when I was a child 
that I argued like a Philadelphia lawyer. Uh, and perhaps that had something to do with it. I could never keep my mouth shut, uh, in, particularly in, in relation to my opinions. Uh, but no, I didn't. A matter of fact, even when I started studying law, it was because I needed a job. And then I found it is incredibly interesting. I actually fell in love with the rule of law long before I fell in love with law. And it's a, it's a, it's a major distinction. Um, as you may or may not know, I'm chairman of the International Commission of Jurists in Australia, which is uh, Geneva-based uh, human rights rule of law organization, which I've been in for over 30 years. So I've always been really interested in the concept of law and the role it can play. That does not mean I have been uh, favorably uh, disposed towards many laws or indeed the way that they're applied. So the thing is, law is a lever. It's not, it's not an iron, it's a lever. As, as you're aware, I teach legal ethics. And one of the things we teach in legal ethics is four different styles of lawyering. Um, one of them is the moral activist. And there's a ethicist in America whom I happen to know at, at Georgetown University named David Laban. And he is the one who coined the term moral activism. And even though he's a non-lawyer, he's a professor of legal ethics at Georgetown. And he's done a lot of work in, in law over the years. Uh, and he really strongly believes that there is a responsibility. He's not alone. I mean, Deborah Rode at Stanford, there's many, there's many um, activist, academic lawyers and lawyers. We've got plenty of them in Australia that actually believe that their job is to be a voice. And uh, this law school, you know, this law school was created by Hal Wooten, who's a friend of mine. In his late 90s, he's still active and going strong. And um, he believes very strongly that law is about create, giving people a voice, giving people, particularly the people that are um, uh, disadvantaged, people that suffer injustice. Those are the people that we have to look after, and those are the people that need a voice. And law, in a sense, can assist those people. When I first came to Sydney, um, I'd been practicing law in London for a few years after I left Brisbane. Uh, when I left Brisbane, um, and that, that becomes a complicated story as well, but um, I was uh, at the time in partnership, in a relationship with a woman named Robin Davidson who wrote a book called Tracks because she walked across the desert with her camels. And I was in, I'd met her in Alice Springs where I was falling in love with the desert and, and Aboriginal culture. But uh, we ended up living in London for a few years. And when we were coming back, we came back to Sydney in 1981. And uh, I was going to go back into law. And I thought I might go back into criminal law. But a really good friend of mine, Terry Budden, who spent a number of years on the Supreme Court, and he's now retired, advised me not to just go back into criminal law, but to understand the New South Wales and particularly Sydney environment. He suggested I get a job in a legal center or something like that to just put my foot in the water, see what it was like. And I got a job as the principal lawyer at Macquarie Legal Center in Parramatta. Um, and that was at a time when the legal center movement was, in my view, at the most vibrant we had Virginia Bell and, and Terry Budden and Julian Disney and Roger West and a whole range of people, Claire Petrie, endless people that are still activists today. Uh, Virginia, of course, is on the high court. But uh, we're all working together for the disadvantaged in, at very low pay in very interesting jobs. And it was one of the most interesting jobs I've ever had. Um, but from there, I once acted for a man who I uh, felt he was disadvantaged because, and discriminated against because he was not allowed to be in the police force in New South Wales because he had only one eye. In some respects, I thought that was a prerequisite. But at any rate, he eventually, I acted for him in a, in a discrimination case, which was very interesting. Um, and because of that, got poached to be the senior lawyer at the Anti-Discrimination Board 
where I worked for a number of years, became president of the Anti-Discrimination Board for a number of years before I became Legal Services Commissioner. So it's all been a, a life um, that has been led almost by non-direction. Uh, things have occurred to me and for me and with me uh, rather than at me. Um, when I was at the Anti-Discrimination Board, um, we were occupied by national action. Um, and that, there was about 16 or 18 balaclava-wearing um, paramilitary-dressed members of national action that actually um, came into our office at the Anti-Discrimination Board, which was then on, the, on Bent Street in Sydney. And, and uh, it was quite interesting, because I happened to be walking past the doors when they ran in. And they, I confronted them and said, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing here? And they said, we demand to see the president. And they said, I am the president. And the leader, who was the biggest of the lot, not necessarily the smartest, uh, said, um, no, you're not. Which, in my view, created a real conundrum for him. Because if I wasn't the president, why would I say I was if they were there to intimidate? And if I was the president and wasn't intimidated, again, what were they going to do? Uh, we had an interesting discussion that lasted for some time as my staff uh, sort of decamped and went down back stairs and left. Uh, I, was, I was stayed there with the, with the uh, members of National Action, and eventually they left. But after they left, uh, I received telephone calls from the news media that said they all had television media, they all had crews on the way, and would I prepare, because I was being occupied by National Action, would I be prepared to give a statement? And I simply said, um, I don't know where you're getting your information. There was a bunch of Boy Scouts here seeking directions, but they're gone. So the media didn't turn up, and the demonstration that National Action had outside my office got no media airplay at all, and they never came back. I think the real advice I would give them is to stick with it. The, um, there's a lot of um, verbiage that flows around uh, the legal profession and this university, and every university in law school, uh, that um, lawyers are going to be obsolete in a few years. I do not believe that to be the case. Um, we've always been around, at least since early English history, um, but there, when we were scribes. But the, the, the thing f for me is that lawyers interpret law for people that don't know law. Um, when I was a criminal lawyer, I, could, I would often be going to various Long Bay jails or Silverwater, or whatever the jails were, to, to visit clients. I was also in the prisoner's legal service. And it was amazing. Almost everybody in remand is, has become a lawyer. They spend all their time in, law, in the, the law libraries reading up on law. And so you'd go in and a, and, a, and a person would sit down and tell you the law um, in associ associated with their particular case. They were almost always wrong. You can read the law, you can't understand the law unless you have a law degree, unless you go through the process. And uh, I think that's really important. But I think what's really important for law schools today is I know that we are moving towards more online services and et cetera, and that's inevitable. But law is about problem solving. Clients want their problems solved. Just simply understanding law is often not enough if you want to really understand law and, and be a, a good lawyer. You have to understand clients. So I would suggest to anybody who's doing a law degree today, if they're thinking of a second degree, Certainly commerce and business have always been a good second degree. I would now think about psychology. I would also think about technology because those are the two areas that law is going into more and more and um, the, the so-called soft skills are becoming more and more important for lawyers rather than just sim simply black letter law. And I think that's really important for law students to understand if they do want to practice law. Many of the students that I teach 
tell me they don't, don't really want to practice law. They're just incredibly interested in the structures of society and the structures of government and the structures of governance. And they would really like to understand that. And so they, they go to a law degree. I don't say it's the new English degree, as some people suggest. It is much more um, important than that, even though English degrees are wonderful. Um, I think that it's, it's a time when more and more people need to be lawyers as lawmakers become more and more prolific and the system, political system within which we work and live becomes more likely to create laws to solve immediate problems rather than long-term solutions. Uh, I'm tempted to go too far off, off course here. Uh, if, if I'm really considering about my legal career, there have been several things that I have found most interesting and, and I'm proud of. One, when I was working in England, I worked for a very radical legal center called Release, which, and which um, I was um, involved in drafting the prisoner transfer agreement between England and Turkey just after the Midnight Express fi film came out. Um, that was incredibly interesting. We were involved with the um, abolition of the death penalty in Singapore. We were involved in all kinds of different major events um, uh, when I was in London. But back in Australia, one of the things I'm most proud of is fairly recent, and that was when, as Legal Services Commissioner, we were given a new piece of legislation which allowed uh, legal practices to incorporate under corporations law. Now, that was the first place in the common law world that this has ever happened. And the legislation that was introduced uh, required a incorporated legal practice, for example, to have appropriate management systems without any explanation as to what they were. And indeed, as the regulator of the legal profession, I actually wanted to look at that and say, well, what does that mean? And I learned a lot about regulation, both at the Anti-Discrimination Board and as Legal Services Commissioner, that compliance-based regulation alone does not work. Um, and so what we had to do is try to figure out how to ensure that incorporated legal practices uh, delivered what they were supposed to under the legislation, which was a appropriate management systems which rendered that firm compliant with the Legal Profession Act. It meant that I, we had to design a new form of regulation. And that new form of regulation required the regulator to be in partnership with the regulator, regulated, to deliver outcomes for the community, which would be then in turn be good for both the regulator and the regulated. It sounds very simple but it created a new model. And we designed something called proactive management-based regulation, something we, we developed ethical infrastructures for law firms, and reduced complaints by two-thirds. And the thing that that taught me was a lot about regulation, and one of the things I'm engaged in at the moment outside of law school is um, how to change regulatory structures in various countries around the world because that process that we designed for incorporated legal practices was adopted by England uh, and Scotland now. Um, Ireland, the Canadians adopted it, and the Americans are now looking at it. And I speak a lot in those countries about legal regulation, but also regulation generally. And so that really taught me how regulation can be a positive uh, rather than a negative force. Well, I, th I, think that's, I think that's true. Uh, <clears throat> when, when I was a young, naive human being, uh, now I'm just an old, naive human being, um, but when I was, when I was uh, on the streets of Berkeley, um, we had a belief that what we were doing was not to actually supplant the existing system with a new system, because our parents would always ask us, well, if you're going to tear it down, what are you going to replace it with? Um, and that is a perennial question for people that want change or want to achieve change. That's not what we were trying to do. 
We were trying to polarize views. We were trying to wake the um, population up. We we were we, we were we were fight, fighting you know lethargy, <laughs> we, we, and and it was a really important thing to get people to form a view. Um, nowadays, I suspect there are people that would say maybe we we did it too well because of the divisions that presently exist in our society. I don't think that was our fault. Um, I think that the divisions that exist in society today are caused by unequal wealth and a whole range of other things that are, that are very difficult um, things to, problems to solve. But we need to have uh, people that are willing to try. We need to have people that are really willing to get the skills, such as a law degree, which is an important one, to actually affect change. Being a lawyer is not just sitting in an office, you know, writing a contract. Being a lawyer is actually translating from those with power to those that do not have power what systems are all about. Oh, um, I suspect if I could have done something different, I would have done more teaching. Uh, when I was much younger, um, I was, uh, I suspect, a, a bit wary of teaching because I thought to be a teacher, you had to know everything. Um, what I've learned, particularly from lecturing at this university, is that teaching is more as much about learning as it is about conveying information that you might have. And I've had a lot of experience, which is useful as being a, a uh, pervader of messages. But the learning experience that I get and the students get has just been wonderful to me. I wish I'd known that earlier. Ooh, um, I don't know. Uh, onwards and upwards. I. Uh, I've never had a life plan. I've had a desire to just live life. Um, I enjoy lots of music. I enjoy lots of things that I do. Um, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy law. Uh, I've got many different things that I do at the moment, including, as I said earlier, uh, redesigning regulation and regulatory systems. I professionalize occupational groups. Um, I try to work with um, various churches in relation to uh, concerns about child sexual assault. Um, I, I have many strings to my bow and, and also run a couple of uh, charitable organizations, Midnight Basketball, things like that. So I, I will stay involved. Uh, I have no desire to be retired. I don't even know what that means. It sounds really desperately boring. but. Um, I just want to continue doing what I'm doing.